Recently I saw a post on Twitter claiming that AI could be powered with quantum vacuum energy. The post was accompanied by a figure from a paper published in Nature. Unfortunately for the poster, but fortunately for science, the paper had nothing to do with extracting energy from the vacuum. Rather, it was a description of an experimental realization of a transistor that uses the Casimir effect to mediate and amplify energy transfer across a new kind of transistor. The Casimir effect is a quantum effect, where if you have two metal plates very close together in a vacuum, a force will appear pulling them together. This force has been measured and is a real phenomenon. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the energy of the vacuum is non-zero. We can also calculate that quantum harmonic oscillators, basically quantum versions of springs, have a non-zero ground state. This means that unlike a real spring which at rest will have zero energy, a quantum spring always has fluctuations. It is always bouncing. From this physicists will often explain that the Casimir effect occurs because the metal plates exclude virtual particles of wavelengths larger than the distance between the plates. Because there are more virtual particles outside the plates than inside, they produce pressure on the plates pushing them together. As with Stephen Hawking's bad explanation of Hawking radiation in A Brief History of Time using illustrations of virtual particles, this explanation is also false. Sadly, the paper on the Casimir effect I consulted for this article which was otherwise very sound, repeated Hawking's falsehood. If you have a sphere next to a plate instead of another plate, the force will be alternatively attractive and repulsive depending on the distance. Using this fact, an extremely tiny sphere of about 1 100 nanometers can be made to levitate an extremely tiny distance, about 1 micrometer or 1000 nanometers, above a plate in Earth's gravitational field. If the explanation involving virtual particles of different wavelengths were correct, then we shouldn't see any repulsion or levitation. Note to physicists, just stay away from explaining phenomena using illustrations of virtual particles. I'm probably guilty of this as well. The transistor described in the Nature paper used this fact and had a setup with a tiny sphere in between two plates. Because the force on the sphere alternates, it can vibrate back and forth mediating energy transfer from one plate to the other. That is energy transfer however not creation from the vacuum. Like Hawking's radiation, the Casimir effect has little to do directly with quantum vacuum fluctuations and more to do with relativity. It is thus strangely connected to last week's post on dark energy and the Unruh effect. The thermal radiation predicted to occur for an object that is constantly accelerating. In this view, thermodynamics is relative to our state of motion, and the curvature of spacetime near gravitational bodies. And the Casimir effect likewise is a relativistic effect. To that end Jaffe published a paper in 2005 showing that the Casimir effect has nothing to do with quantum vacuum at all. Rather it is simply a realization of the relativistic van der Waals force between the two plates. The van der Waals force binds molecules together because of quantum electrodynamics and likewise the Casimir effect. As the fine structure constant which governs the coupling between charged objects goes to zero, the Casimir effect disappears while if we allow it to become large we get the familiar Casimir force. Hence, the Casimir effect is merely the result of adding relativistic quantum corrections to electromagnetism. As with the Casimir effect for a sphere, the van der Waals force also changes from attractive to repulsive at a certain distance called the van der Waals contact distance. The theory is that the electron cloud around an atom, which is a kind of quantum probability cloud, can become more or less dense on one side of the atom versus the other. 
This creates a weak charge on the atom which allows atoms to either have like or different charges. At near distances the force is repulsive while at far distances it is attractive meaning that atoms tend to stay in an equilibrium distance apart unless a stronger force comes along. At large distances Jaffe showed the Casimir effect is dominated by the relativistic van der Waals force. These are relativistic because they deal with electromagnetic waves propagating at the speed of light. This finite propagation speed means that an electromagnetic event in the past can cause a reaction in the present. We refer to this as a retarded potential. Retarded potentials don't matter if an electromagnetic field is static and unchanging but, if charges are moving around, then it matters a great deal. Casimir and Polder originally calculated his effect this way without referring to the zero-point energy of the vacuum, but, after showing his results to Niels Bohr, he was encouraged to come up with a simpler calculation using vacuum energy. The zero-point energy calculation is vastly simpler but also obliterates the dependence on the fine structure constant, so that the effect now appears to be purely related to the vacuum with nothing to do with the electromagnetic interactions between neutral plates. This has a lot of implications not only for how we understand quantum field theory, but explanations for the cosmological constant. If vacuum energy isn't real, then the cosmological constant can't be derived from it. Many physicists now question whether quantum vacuum fluctuations exist at all, and suggest that they may simply be imaginary contributors to our mathematical system for calculating quantum effects, similar to the imaginary numbers that appear when solving cubic equations with real roots. In the end, we can only measure effects between real things, and if those effects appear to include contributions from the vacuum, it could simply be a side effect of our mathematical machinery, rather than implying some reality that we cannot directly perceive. As absurd as that sounds, it may have implications for how we understand quantum gravity. Postscript for those who read my last post, the Casimir effect can also be related to the Unru effect for accelerating objects and this will show how the zero-point energy explanation fails. We normally think of the Unru effect as something that happens to rockets accelerating out into deep space, but it applies just as much to atoms that are accelerating because of the Casimir effect. If you consider an atom experiencing a constant force and you place yourself in the same state of motion as the atom, you will see a Rindler horizon behind the atom. That Rindler horizon will produce thermal energy which itself creates a force. Suppose that energy is sufficient to keep the atom in a constant state of acceleration. This is the Casimir levitation trick except there isn't another piece of matter causing it. It might make more sense if a black hole were responsible since black holes have matter in them, but a Rindler horizon just comes from a state of motion. If however there is no zero-point energy, then this can't happen. There is no radiation after all coming from the Rindler horizon, you need matter to produce the van der Waals force to levitate the atom like this. Theoretically, the energy that produces that force could convert to radiation which might explain Unru radiation, essentially it would cause drag on the accelerating atom or rocket or what have you even in empty space. An alternative is that, Hawking and Unru radiation come from the ambiguity in curved space-times and accelerated reference frames of the very notion of a particle. Accelerating particles are known to emit Larmor radiation, which by the equivalence principle must also be the case for particles that are stationary with respect to a black hole event horizon, or supported above the Earth. The very concept of radiation however, is not invariant between inertial, non-accelerated, and accelerated reference frames, which also applies to black holes. This means that Hawking and Unruh radiation are simply an effect of changing reference frames, where we go from observing particles emitting Larmor radiation, to absorbing Unruh Hawking radiation. In other words, the emission of a particle in an inertial reference frame, becomes the absorption of a particle in the accelerated frame.